Hello, welcome to Spring Boot Learning, the channel where you learn about Spring Boot and you have fun doing it. I'm your host, Greg Turnquist. And before we get going, be sure to click on that, hit the subscribe button and click the bell. That way you don't miss anything. And I'm going to bring in our illustrious guest for today. The one, the only Glenn Renfro. Hi, ho. glad to have you here. Oh, man, it is awesome. Thanks for the invitation. I look forward to chatting with you and sharing all things spring that I know about. Have you ever somebody ever come up to you and just say, I just have a question about spring and you're going, oh, um, I don't work on that part of spring, but let me go look at it. And you start going, well, if I think the spring way of doing things, I might be able to talk it out with the person. And you actually kind of figure it out with the person. I've done that so many times. It's like, oh, we're doing this with spring, uh, you know, let's say spring data. And I'll go, in, oh, I don't know. Let's go look at it. And just using that kind of spring thoughts process is like, ah, I know how to help you here. So. Now that's a perfect that's a perfect segue into our opening question that I want to throw at you. And I assure you, he has not seen this question. Okay, maybe he has seen this question a little in advance and had time to think about it. But what is the hardest problem you've had to solve? Maybe maybe we could find it, say, in the past year, in the past 12 months, that that's not just a, a CRUD app, just a web page in front of a database, but instead something that's a little more insidious than that what can you think of oh gosh um anything that has the word transaction in it um <laughs> um we had someone it was a it was a issue someone opened i, I gotta look it up this is it, you, hey this is live people uh but it was um it was an issue where somebody was doing something with a transaction manager and with spring cloud task, uh, we have a transaction manager in the background and we had to work in where we could have two transaction managers or pair them together. And the good news was, is that we found, I just, uh, you know, worked with the, uh, uh, you know, I kind of worked with it and found a, just a smooth transition. So now people out there get that goodness of being able to have, you know, a different transaction manager uh, with spring task. A task could do one of two things. It would say, hey, okay, you want to use yours? Fine. You want to use mine? Fine. You want to have both at the same time? That's fine. To the user, it's all configuration. So that was like one of those ones you had to think, it goes head scratch, like, how would I do that? What's a what's a good way we can share it with folks? So now that was a kind of a bone you throw out to the audience there when you said, Well, I don't work on that part of spring. So why don't you kind of share what are the parts of spring that you do work on and then in you know, in particular what you lead on? Oh well, um, well, I work on Spring Cloud Task. I, I am the uh, project owner of that. I work on Spring Cloud Dataflow. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Talk about orchestration, and then we're going to also I work on uh, with my mood by scene on Spring Batch, and I'm actually uh, working a little bit more in kind of some of the kind of getting into a little bit more of the Spring Cloud ecosystem a little bit, um, uh, and trying to get a little bit more into that zone. So uh, certainly three projects of Dataflow, Task, and Batch for now, but starting to look a little bit more into the Spring Cloud ecosystem. Now we're definitely going to go into a bit more of that as we get further into the live stream, but uh, I thought this was emblematic. For I want to let the audience know that for today's <laughs> coupon code to get, if you take the, the, the coupon code Spring Cloud Task and go over to leanpub.com, you can get all my books over there uh, marked down to $15 each. So... Um, Go grab that. And by the way, you know, I right now we're on YouTube, but my hope is if we can get enough members to 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 sign on can and join the thing and I can support it because I got to pay for this out of pocket. I would certainly love to be able to start streaming on other platforms simultaneously, like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. So if you are are you get if you get value out of this content, smash the like button and then think about becoming a Spring Boot Learning channel member over at springbootlearning.com slash member. Now there's a little something else that before before we get to our main subject there about spring cloud task and, and orchestration and and that gnarly gnarled goodness, um, there's a little there's a little little tiny event that happens once a oh, year down in Atlanta. Uh, is that is that Valentine's Day? Is that is that uh, uh, Christmas? I don't think it's in February. I, I think it's in April. I think it's April. Yes, Dev Nexus is coming, folks. Uh, it is uh, a. We're going to. It is a the 
one of the largest, if not the largest, Java con conference in the United States or North America. Uh, we have, um, oh gosh, we have, uh, we're, I think we're going to have 11 tracks, 110 talks. Uh, we just posted our uh, talks up on uh, devnexus.com, and it is April 12th through the 14th. Uh, day the 12th is going to be workshops. Days 13 and 14 are just a regular conference. Um, I'm trying to remember, uh, you could get the early bird discount now. Uh, see, hold on. This, see, this is where I should have been prepared. I, I know. Um, let's see. The early bird is three forty-five, and uh, and that's probably about the cheapest conference that I know of uh, out there. Um, uh, for uh, content, uh, all the big speaker, Josh Long's coming in. Um, Oh my goodness! I'm trying to think who else. Uh, I think Spencer is scheduled to come in. Uh, we got all sorts of good folks coming in for this this uh, 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 conference. Take a look, and uh, Ben Cat's going to be there, so that'll be awesome. Oh, yeah, I think he was the guy. The last time I went to Dev Nexus in person, um, I looked at the schedule when I that gosh that was four years ago or something, and. Um, they had scheduled him at the same time as me. And I said, well, then me that means no one's coming to mind. I know I'm going to go to Venkat. But I looked at the schedule and he was actually booked for six different slots. So after I finished mine, I went over and watched one of his. And then at the end of that, I was like, okay, now I think I get why everybody goes to his talks because he's he's a phenomenal presenter. So it was it was uber cool. Yeah, Neil but, Ford's going to both uh, – Neil Ford will be there as well. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's – it's it's a uh, 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 Oh, gosh, like I said, it's a 110 talks on all things job. I think we do. We we are where so I should say we we also have an agile track. Uh, you also we also have a, you know, everybody's polyglot. So we also have a web JavaScript track, um, Java platform, Java uh, tools. Um, goodness. Uh, so it's it, it, that's the thing is like you know when I, I'm one of the people that does the paper selection and you see all these great papers come in from all you know all over and it's like we got a hundred slots and you're having to go through hundreds of papers to look at what which ones do people want to listen to and all these papers are so good and it's it's exciting to kind of read through what people are doing and but uh, it's again it's you know again thank you for all the people who have submitted uh, talks this year. Uh, really hard to kind of go through and, and make those final selections. So, but uh, this year is really exciting to see. Uh, we even got uh, this kind of thing on the log for J2 hiccup. That's going to be, there's a talk on that. Uh, so we, this year we will have a little bit more of a security uh, emphasis this year for the uh, conference. Yes. Um, that's something that, you know, uh, not only we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's I was trying to find the right word here. Um, you know, uh, but you know, DevSecOps is the you know one of the uh, things I was looking for talks on. It's like, okay, you know, we're just you know, DevOps is cool, but DevSecOps is now something a lot way more. You know, we should be emphasizing a bit more. So there's going to be a couple of chats on that too. Now that's a budding topic that I haven't heard as much about. So that would be a really cool thing and. And you cannot understate the the networking opportunity because there are just so many people oh from the Java and, and Spring communities come to this conference that it's a real opportunity to meet people. You you may have interacted with these people for ten years, but here's your chance to to run into them face to face, and and uh, that's that's totally awesome stuff. It truly is, and we're still shooting for in person. Uh, you know, th we're 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 monitoring the COVID situation. And, you know, if, if it, but it's so far way we're reading and what, how the timing goes, it looks like this might be, things are still going forward for an in-person conference. So we're excited by it. All right. Cool beans. Um, now, as we get further into this live stream, we're going to get into some really, you know, big, strange and, uh, oh, fun stuff that you fun. solve. And, um, uh, uh, before we get before we get into to all that, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit a little bit more in depth about things like Spring Cloud Task. Like what 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 is Spring Cloud Task? If you had to boil it down, and you know, you you have you get on the elevator at the conference, and somebody says, "What do you do?" And you say, "I work on Spring Cloud Task." What's that? 
That is a great question. And I'll, I'll tell you this way. So when we think about microservices these days, uh, or even, you know, let's put it this way, cloud-based applications or microservices, what we think about is an app that starts, does something and terminates, or if you will, you know, so I, what we could think of as a batch application, or if I'm using a Spring Boot app, just a boot app that starts, does something and terminates. So um, sometimes we only call those as short-lived microservices. And that is a microservice that has a, does something and then terminates. It's not long running, it doesn't stay up. It has a purpose, uh, not to say that long runnings don't, but it has a purpose and once that's done, it's complete. So the goal of the task was to do this. How can we have a microservice in a cloud infrastructure and have it be a good citizen? Right. So um, when we're running something like, say, in uh, uh, Kubernetes and that Kubernetes is on any given cluster out there in the real world, um, it starts. How do we know it lived outside, say, hey, there's this leftover pod here that we might have something go out there and clean it up. How do we know it lived? What happened to it when it finished? What was its state? Um, and what where did we you know i can run it in n number of clusters or namespaces i want to go to one place and check to see where what happened to this task or th this given uh, uh uh application that ran this ephemeral application and that's what spring cloud task does it allows you to add a, a simple annotation at enable task and what you can do is you tell it what database it should report that information to. And then when data, or sorry, when Spring Cloud tasks start or your application starts, task behind the scenes will record. My app started at this time. It had this kit stated when it started. And when it runs through that whole process and or your app runs through this whole process is at the end, it will record, hey, this was the state of the app when it finished. Um, uh, um, you know, this is the, if there was an exception, it will record that, but you're like, well, that's pretty simple. What else does it do? Well, we also allow you to have, um, you know, what is, since I can run my app in any clusters, what if I only have this app to work in one place, right? Have it one run, have it run. I don't want another instance to run at the same time, right? Um, so with Spring Cloud Task, you can set a property that says allow only one. And so when it starts, it runs. And when it finishes, or sorry, when it starts and one starts running, if you try to start another instance of that given application, uh, Task will say, uh-uh, you told me not to allow this one to run. I'm stopping because another instance is running somewhere else. Um, you have before, after task and error processing that you get, all you have to do is add in uh, an annotation to a method if you want to do that, or you can uh, implement an interface to do that. Uh, oh my goodness, what else do we do? Uh, it also allows you to send out messages. So you can have um, at different stages, like if the app started or when the app stops or when the app has an error, it, you can hook it into a messaging framework like Kafka or Rabbit, and it'll emit a message out there saying, hey, my app started, my app ended, oh, my app had a mistake so or had a hiccup, so that you can actually go in and take some, what I would word is, um, uh, um, self-healing uh, app job, or what we call a self-healing batch job, where I could say, on error, send out this message, and then I have a... Um, messaging queue that's listening and when it sees that a message occurs you can actually write your own app that gets launched that maybe cleans something up or does a fix and then restarts your batch app um so, that so self-healing um, that's not a feature it offers but you can do uh -huh. that with that so it's a real different paradigm or concept or, or different flow than saying i need to i need 100 copies of this web app to run that needs to stay up all the time if i have you know i've allocated 100 modules or nodes or units to support this task job there's a whole different concept of what it means you know cloud cloud solutions aws cloud foundry what have you right. they need to get 100 copies of their app up and running for a traditional web app and they need to keep it up and running all the time but a task thing that's doing work for you it, that's not the same thing at all it's a it's right. different flow that you have to contend with yeah, and you could think of it as like, well, that's kind of a batch job. And it's like, yeah, it is a batch job. It's something that starts, does its job, terminates. The advantage is, is that it's, it's that middle tier that you get between a long-running process, right? Something that a web 
app or web service that starts up, does something, it stays up for a long time, maybe get repaved every once in a while, but stays up. Um, it's different than a function, where a function is something that you may have like a, a, a fast service that goes in, you can send requests, it does, it spins up a, a function or calls a function, function returns result complete. Um, this is like something that's a little bit more heavy duty. You might do what we're going to go ahead and say, talk about a little later maybe, but talk about CRUD operation, right? Um, that's a little bit more long-term and needs a lot more work than just what a typical function would do, right? So it's that middle space in there that, uh, and that's where uh, you would run like, again, this ephemeral microservice, um, or if you will, call it just old traditional batch application. You know, in my old job, we had to run this ops center that ran 24 by 7 and monitored 8,000 sites. So we had we had one application that read, you know, had SNMP traffic, like 100,000 alarms a day would flow into the system and it would digest it, process it, and give a, a real-time readout to somebody's um, thick client app or, you know, maybe web app if we'd actually done that. But, you know, but then there was this other thing where you had to go crank out a monthly report and, you know, you had to go join yes. table today and that query would take 15 minutes. You know, that report would take 15 minutes to operate. So, um, you know, we hand rolled that new stuff. But if we would had cloud stuff back in back then like that, you know, that may have been a handy usage for something like a spring cloud task. To right. And the thing is, is what you say, well, Glenn, we're still running on metal. We don't run stuff in the cloud yet. Right. We or we might be doing a hybrid where we're running stuff on metal, but we're also running stuff in AWS. We may be running some things on metal. We're running some things in a Kubernetes cluster we have somewhere. Right. In that case. Task Spring Cloud Task can assist you in both locations, even though you're still doing on metal. All these features I talk about, they fit in the traditional on metal environment, or if you're doing hybrid. Um, it's again, uh, when I talked about said so what cluster did I run it in, it could be what did I run it in my Kubernetes and on what cluster my Kubernetes, or did I run it on metal? Okay, well, Task can help you record that, and again. I might be running, I might spun up one that was on Kate Kubernetes, but then I might have accidentally spun up one or somebody's, you know, maybe a, there's a scheduler and a scheduler says, oh, I'm launching another one, but the previous one didn't finish. Okay. Oh, we don't want to run at the same time. Stop the second one, right? No matter where it's right. run. Um, again, the signaling, how it sends out notifications. Uh, oh my goodness. There's other things that it has, but we're going to, I'm going to save that to another part of our conversation of how right. Spring Cloud Task can help you with all that good stuff. That's well, an in intro. Of, yeah, and part of the you know part of the magic what Spring does is you know I can always remember Rod Johnson's uh, point he made at the 2008 Spring Experience. I think it was called Spring Experience at the time, which was reducing Java complexity. And it's Spring is always out to try to simplify. So in the sense of well, you have jobs to run, and and you pointed out whether you're running on bare metal or you're running on some cloud-based solution spring is like there to try to let's break stuff up into their layers so you should be able to you know write your logic and business code that does the job and, and it and it, it it shouldn't matter at this layer where it's running in a sense that that may be a a configuration setting or simple deployment action of where you push out your app as to how it actually runs with it Exactly. And that's the goal of, of uh, you know, one of the goals we have is like when you write your app, your app should focus on what your business problem. Right. How can we help you write, help you focus on that business problem? It, it's just that sometimes that when you're saying, hey, I've got, you know, how this is handling this business problem. You know, I've got schedulers that are running, you know, a traditional cron job. Right. That goes off and spins something up every hour on the hour. Well, sometimes that app runs long. Right. Or again, you know, my app is running and run out of database space. Not to say that that would ever happen, right? Well, it does. And, but all I have to do is have that ability to restart my app, right? To pick up, how do I do that? How do I or, or alert somebody that the database ran out of space? You know, your app can be that one that signals that, hey, I failed because of this error. And then somebody can go in, oh, right. Um, how does this compare with, say, traditional Spring Batch? Does this mean... <sighs> Surely yes. this doesn't mean that Spring Batch itself is dead, right? No, Spring Batch is rocks. I know people are kind of going, oh, did he say Spring Batch apps rock? Yes, Batch is great. Come on, folks. You know, it's it's one of those things where I work with both Spring Cloud Stream and Spring Batch. I, uh, 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 and, and that's 
we'll talk more about that with the data flow. You know, the best the best part here is you guys, I have this issue. We have this problem we want to solve, right? This is a business problem. Um, what's the best way to do it, right? Is it is it streaming and handling the vids as they occur, or is it better, hey folks, let's let's gather the information and, and run a single batch app that that will to to do all that work at once, right? So, you know, let's say in this case we go, well, okay, we could do event handling. No, I think it, the better, the best utilization is to handle it as, is process it all at once, right? Let's let's we don't have to handle it as it comes in. We can wait, and then it also will save us a little bit of money because we're gonna instead of keeping one app running all the time, we're gonna just focus on this one app when it can run for maybe an hour, right? Save time, save memory, right? So let's go do, let's go launch on this. Let's go play with that. So. Uh, that means I've got to go in. I've got to write my code that will go read in the data from, let's say, uh, a Kafka topic, right? Uh, then I've got to write that out to a, a JDBC data source. Okay, I got to think about transactions. I got to think about restartability. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay, let me get started. Why? Why would you do that? That's where Spring Batch comes in, right? So Spring Batch says, look. Here's what we're going to give you through just configuration. You can create, we, uh, I could go through a whole list of readers that Spring Batch gives me, whether it's JDBC, Kafka, Rabbit. Uh, um, I'm thinking, oh my, you know, my brain just blitzes out on some and all this stuff. Flat file, um, uh, you know, it, the list goes on and on, right? Of all these, uh, no, you know, no SQL reads, right? So all these things it can read from, right? And then I, then I can configure that instead of writing it, right? And then I can configure my writer. So again, all those things that I talked about before, whether it's Kafka, Rabbit, um, JDBC, JMS, exactly, all these, I can take and read from all of these and write the, and write the reader and writer and just configure that. And then the only code I really have to write outside to configure those is the process. How do I want to process that? And the good news about that is that since I can focus on writing that code, everything else is configuration. Then remember mm -hmm. how I said about transactions, right? Well, right. sometimes it's like, well, how do I handle the transactions, the chunking? I got to write that code. No. Batch does that for you too. Mm -hmm. You can configure how you want your app to, to chunk, right? So, Again, it goes back into I, all this stuff is configuration. Then you say, well, Glenn, we were talking about hiccups that happen in the real world. OK, well, through Spring Batch, do I have to write specialized code to handle this? No, I can, again, write. I, I don't have to write a lot of code. I just go in and say, I want, I, you know, at, after each step, and you'll learn a lot about that when you play a batch. I can put in information into a context to saying this is where I'm at, this is what I last processed, so that if your app gets canned for whatever reason, you could just kick it back off and it can pick up the state and then run where it left off at, right? So you're given all these wonderful features through just configuration. And the best news is, is a lot of the things you get, you know, for just getting that boot that that stuff set up for batch is done for you in boot right so again all you have to focus is creating your reader bean your writer bean configuring your transaction and then um write that one processor bean and you're pretty much done you've created your first single step batch job there and then i can have multiple steps i could create workflows through it it's really awesome what you can do with, with batch so you're saying okay glenn then why do i need task Let's go back to the original definition of task. We're going to run this batch, this ephemeral app, in a cloud or on metal. Where? How does it interface with the real world? Well, how does it make a good citizen? And you add in, add enable, enable task, and you get all the features that task give with it. So it works with batch to give you a ephemeral microservice, that short-lived microservice. Then, I'm going to assume that if you start with a spring batch job and you've you've kind of built that up and then somewhere down the road, you're like, I need this to scale. I need I want to take this to the cloud. I'm going to assume that's that's a very lightweight task to then say, well, we're going to upgrade to spring cloud tasks to do this for we're, we're, we're in the situation. We need that now. Right. And then all you have to do is take your batch app where you have you'll see when you play with a bat with a batch job, you'll say enable batch processing. 
that uh, when and you, it pre-configures and all, again, you add your, just your beans and your transaction configuration. All you have to do is that that annotation, add enable task, and you get that basic configure you know, that basic uh, 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 Spring Cloud task experience working with that batch. And then something else you get with bat task says, hey, you've got a batch app here. You're using Spring Batch. Good for you. Well, let's do this for you. What we will do is that if that if the batch job ends, and you can tell for Spring Cloud Task through configuration, again, just setting a little property, hey, if my batch job ends, I want you to emit this exit code, right? Ah, because ah, see, a batch app that ends does not mean that you're going to get an exit code other than zero. Or, you know, it's just going to say, well, your app ran, but your batch job failed, your exit code zero. Well, you can go in through a property and Spring Cloud Task and saying, hey, if the batch job fails, set an exit code to something else, right? Uh, and that yes. might be valuable for you when you're running Kubernetes. You're like, hey, I want it to restart on a automatically restart on failure, right? The default. Mm -hmm. So how would I do that? I would say I would set that property in Spring Cloud Task to allow that to happen. Um, other things that you can do. So in, ta in batch, you can take Let's say I'm dealing with millions of records, right? Okay, and I want to partition it, these into 100,000, maybe the you know uh, all the A's to B's, C's to E's, and break them up by maybe the first letter of the of the last name of the person. Just simple example, right? And that's how I want to handle my billing, like a bill run. Well, in that case, in Spring Cloud. Bat, or sorry, Spring Batch, what you can do is you can create what's called partitioning, and I can partition that data into those segments and then run them in parallel. And again, how do you do that? Configuration. And that's what's awesome about it, right? So you just write a little bit of configuration code and you're done, which is awesome. But the one other thing you can do with it, which is really cool, is that I can do that through threading, doing just, you know, taking my app and threading it out and handling it that way, or through Spring Cloud Task, I can have what's called remote partitioning, and you can tell Spring you can tell Spring uh, Cloud Task, I have this partition out there. I want to run these partitions remotely, and then you can implement your uh, write up your partitioning how you want your partitioning to take advantage of what Spring Cloud Tasks through that, and then so your app will start your 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 main app will start, and then when it hits that partition code, it will launch uh, uh, copies of your app and process just those segments of data for you. And at the end of that running those segments, it all your app will come back and, and your main app will come back and take up and pick up and run the, the rest of the code. So what this does dynamically expand and contract in your in the cloud in a yes, sense. Yes, yes, yes. And that's what's awesome about it, right? And that it can on your cloud bill for the month then. <laughs> it could. And and that's the thing is that you you flex that out as much or as little as you want. Uh again, it, it works on metal, right? It works on uh uh Kubernetes, uh name your flavor of Kubernetes, uh Tandu application service, it works there. So Pick where you want it to go. So it does that. Uh, the other thing that we have uh, offered through Spring um, Cloud Task is, is you can, when you start writing batch jobs, or, you know, we gave you a very simple case where we said, uh, like a bill run, right? I want to read from maybe the uh, transactions that occurred or the things off of a Kafka topic. Uh, after they, pro you know, read through it, do some processing, write out the, the bill at the end and insert that into a database. Um, I can have other steps in there where maybe I read data from that uh, uh, that that bill run and then process it and actually generate the bills themselves, right? Not just the records, right. but the bills themselves. That's a two-stepper. Batch does that beautifully. You just you just tell job you tell batch run step one, run step two. But many cases, people say I just have this one. Thing I need to do. I need to read from a maybe read from a JDBC source, right? Process it and write it out to another JDBC sync, right? Ooh. How can I do that and just really just write the processor, right? No, I I I I, I want to set these up via you know, and I told you earlier to, through uh, you could do it through configuration, right? What if I just want to do that but using properties, right? So Spring Cloud Task allows you 
to go in and uh, uh, create a single step batch job. It works with Spring Batch and you can create a single step batch job by setting the properties for your reader, setting properties for your writer. And the uh, only code you really have to write is your processor as a bean. So instead of you gluing all the parts together, you can effectively let task glue it, do it for, for you. you. Right, you know, and it I, uses Spring Batch as its as its strength. You know, I'd never thought much about batch jobs. Um, you know, early on in my career, but it was I think it was the year when Michael Manella joined the Spring team, and he he came on as the lead for Spring Batch at the time, and um, he gave a, he gave a, a presentation at Spring One that year. I love it. He got literally tens of million tens of millions of records. Um, I think it was data based on a particular popular video called the Star Wars Kid. <laughs> So, I don't know if you remember that. I remember video. that. The and so sport. Yep. I'm, I'm kind of like watching this guy walk up on stage and it's to talk about batch. And I'm like, what in the world can somebody do to talk about batch? That's exciting. And he had, he had written a job when I essentially had parsed all the days, like tens of millions of records of, I think it was like all the IP addresses around the world where had, they had viewed this video and he would, he sat there and processed them. And then, and then I think piped him to show him on a on a it was either a report or a web page with that showed where all the views had happened, and you know he's able to show how you know, it, it partitioned the data, it split it, it it digested it, and it's and it's like that was one of the coolest presentations I'd seen. Like ah, batch stuff, and it doesn't it doesn't have to be boring. <laughs> Well, it's what's exciting about it is you can blend the technologies together. It doesn't mean that batch sits isolated itself. I mean, we, we can think about, well, we're moving, you know, mainframes are going to be out there for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they are, you know, you talk about long running processes. Well, you're going to have long running machines out there. And those are, those are mainframes, right? But the good news is, is if you want to move those apps out there to a, a, a cloud infra or even to on metal, batch helps you do that. So you it's that okay, we have that traditional view of running stuff on a mainframe. We need to move off to a mainframe or what we can into a infrastructure, or I might have a uh, just a huge monolith out there that you say, I want to take some of that elements, maybe not all of it, and I can put those out into a batch app, right? Mm -hmm. How can I do that? Well, Spring Batch will do, allow you to do that. Task fits on top of that to simple to allow it to be work into your infrastructure smoother. But then we have this other thing where it's like, look, why, you know, apps don't live in isolation now. I could be streaming data live and getting data streamed in and at certain points kick off a batch job to process it when we reach these certain milestones, right? And so you could create streams through Spring Cloud Stream that handles these events as they come in and then have your an app actually kick off a batch job to do some processing, right? Um, again, mm -hmm. that's a it's it's you can you know it, it's just gets into the architecture of how do you put build your infrastructure together to make sure that stuff gets processed in the most effective way for your customers, but also how do you build it in such a way that it reduces our cost? And what's the best yeah. way to do that, right? I can remember back this uh, again back around 2008 was when Spring Batch kind of it entered the scene and the original creator of it was of course, Dave Sire. Sire, he, yes. With hands in everything. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, a new project was also emerging spring integration led by Mark Fisher. That yes. Many people out there will know is one of the, the legends of the of spring community. Um, and I can remember, you know, all the hallway chats or the sessions where the people would be asking questions and all these questions would always emerge in this problem space. Do I want, do I want batch? Do I want integration? And, it was always it was always contingent on the factors. What are you doing? And, it was, and I could tell it was like these are two projects that don't live far apart. They really work together a lot, and that's yes. what y'all have spent a considerable amount of effort with things like you know Spring Cloud Stream is the cloud based uh, relative of Spring Integration, while Spring Cloud Task is the cloud based relative to Spring Batch. Yeah, and, and, and Spring Cloud Stream fits on top. It actually uses Spring Integration. So if you mm -hmm. know the Spring Integration, Stream works right off of integration. It's not a something that supersedes it, right? It's something that works with it. And you don't have to go dig all the way down to Spring Integration. You can take advantage of what Spring Cloud Stream can do for you 
by deploying your apps or events in, in the cloud, right? Without having to go into Spring integration. But if you have to, to get into it is so, it's, it's no problem at all. You, it allows you to utilize the strengths of Spring integration as well. Um, same way with task. Task does not supersede batch. It works with it, right? It just simplifies your experience when you're deploying that into a cloud or, again, on metal. Now, I don't know. I don't remember who it was. I don't know if it was Fisher and, and Sire that actually had brewed up the idea where they there was there was just this constant talk about uh, streaming stuff, batching stuff, streaming, running all together. And it was several years ago where somebody had the um, keen idea that, like, put them together. And um, yes, by the way, everyone that's watching this, whether you're in the live stream or if you watch this on the replay, smash the like button if you're getting value out of this. Um and thus, they, they created a new project called Spring. At the time, it was called Spring XD. Uh, for what, I think it's Oh, Spring my Data. gosh. Yes. Oh. And that was essentially, let's grab the parts of it and make it easy to, to, to stir them together. And, and that eventually progressed to what we now call Spring Cloud Data Flow, which I yes. think came up to Nashville several years ago and gave us a presentation on this. So what what is Spring Cloud Dataflow, the the successor to Spring XD? All right, well let's think about this, folks. So I'm running. Let's let's talk about two sides of the equation, right? Let's talk stream first. With Spring Cloud, so when we talk about stream, I have I have data that's coming in. Let's say I'm retrieving data from Twitter, right? And as I'm retrieving this data from Twitter, um, uh, from let's say the, the Twitter firehose, I'm going to be uh, maybe there's a big sporting event that's coming up really soon, right? And in this big sporting event, I am a pizza company. And what I want to do is I want to track all the events that are occurring uh, Twitter. And I want to get all that data, but as, it, as and, and I want to store it for future analysis. But for now, what I want to be able to do is extract out words like pizza, hungry, um, uh, maybe my competitor's name, maybe our name. And see when people are 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 starting to chime in and chat about um, pizza. Maybe it's at the middle part of your game, right? And in the, during that middle part of the game, you start seeing a lot of chatter about that. You're like, well, you know what? What we're going to do is we want to be able to capture that information. So we're going to first off take the main data, store it into a data store somewhere, but then we're going to uh, uh, use the uh, just a, the enterprise integration pattern called tap, right? And we're going to tap off of that mainstream and then we're going to filter that data and we want to filter that data. This is all live and look for those keywords. Like I said, pizza, hungry, discounts, uh, you know, munchies, whatever, right? Or our, our name, our competitor's name. And after we see that we, we filter those out and then we have a processor that goes in and looks at it and says, my goodness, we've reached a certain threshold what we want to be able to do as we reach that threshold is maybe to put out a tweet that says, hey, if you tweet, if you, you know, if you're that hungry, buy our pizza, here's a coupon code along with a link and you can get 25% off of, you know, your order, if you order right now kind of thing, right? So we want to be able to create that main primary stream that takes that data, stores it off tap it so that we can get that information to the analysts, right? So they can take that data, break apart and know when that they want to, or at least automate, either automatically or manually put out that other tweet so that we can incentivize people to buy our pizza. Well, right now that makes me hungry, just making that <laughs> statement. But so there we go, right? So we have created this stream. Okay, cool. That's a very good example. Now, what we can do after the game is, is I can write up a batch application, right? That can go in and look at that data and extract out way more data from it, or you know, even get more data out of it to do some additional processing with it, right? And maybe generate like four or five reports. So cool. Two very simple cases. Can you and I use Spring Cloud Stream to be able to create the apps and simplify the creation of each of those apps, like the one that gathers the data, that source that gathers the data for maybe write a Twitter source, right? And then write a JDBC sync, something that can store that data into like say a relational database and have Spring Cloud Stream allow me to hook into, if you will, um, I write that JDB, that, sorry, that Twitter source. How do I get that data to that sync that's going to write that data out to a JDBC? 
Well, I can go in and say, well, I want to use Kafka maybe as my primary, not you know, or it could be Rabbit, you know, as my messaging framework to get the data from here to here. I don't want to lose any of that data. Okay. Well, do I? How much? How much Rabbit do I need to know? I I don't want to have to understand how to read the data from Twitter and then write to JDBC. I really don't want to have to know how to also pull in Kafka. Really? How can I do that? And the answer is I can use Spring Cloud Stream because Spring Cloud Stream says, look, you don't have to worry about any of that. You write a function that can get your data from wherever you want your data from, in this case, Twitter. So you write a function to do that. And we'll call that a source. That JDBC sync that writes out to a data store, um, write a function that writes that out. So you write two functions, okay? Nothing more than that. And then when you write those two functions, then I could bring in Spring Cloud Stream as a dependency. Then I bring in, uh, or sorry, sorry, Spring Cloud Stream uh, a starter, because this is all Spring Boot. And then I say, what binder do I want? I'm going to use, let's say I'm going to use Rabbit this time, right? So I you say, I want to, I'll add in the Spring Cloud Stream binder starter. And then, I add in a couple of properties to say, you know, where how, where do these two belong? And then guess what? I'm done, right? I wrote a function to get data from Twitter. I wrote a function to write data to JWC source. And now I have two applications that focus on that and use this messaging framework between them called Rabbit. Again, it could be Kafka. Added two dependencies and I'm done. And you're like, well, why not put that in one app? Well, now I can create taps off of that data, right? Like I said, using thinking about, again, enterprise integration patterns, and I can create taps off of that data that as that data is coming in from that Twitter, I can tap off and create other apps that go in and filter that data, process that, enrich that data, and then and then maybe do some more cleaning and then hand that data directly to our analysts so they can get that work done. And when I do this, when I'm writing this, these code, this code, I write functions. And as I write these functions, the good news about writing the functions is, again, all I have to do is focus on writing the function, but to connect that into that framework, right? That tap, that uh, 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 to uh, hook it into that, sorry, that rabbit or that Kafka. Again, I just put in two dependent starters, Spring Cloud Stream starter, the Spring Cloud Stream binder, rabbit or Kafka or whatever one you want. It could be they they've got a ton out there, Kinesis, um, like Google Pub Sub, whatever, whichever you're using for your messaging framework. And that's it. And then they, from then it's you set up a couple of properties. And Spring Cloud Stream allows us to do that, which is a okay. We've talked and so that's so now we create this infrastructure of a stream simply. Okay, that's process A. Process B is we write our Spring Cloud task or Spring Batch to look at that historical data, process it, do, it, do its work whenever, or it can, you know, whatever you want it to, to be. But so where does data flow fit into all this? Well, I don't write just one stream. I write thousands of streams, right? And when I write, when I'm deploying ta or, uh, my batch apps, I'm not just running one batch app, I'm launching thousands of batch apps. Mm. How do you orchestrate all this? How do you know what streams are running out there? How do you how do you put the streams together, right? Um, how can we simplify that? Mind you, I just said to put these streams together, it's just properties, right? That's easy. But once you start talking about hundreds or thousands of streams, you have to, how do you orchestrate that? And then Okay, once I have a stream out there, what if I need to do an update to an app, right? right. It's I got to be able to update these apps, and how do I do that? Well, that's where Dataflow kicks in. Dataflow is your orchestrator for this. So what Spring Cloud Dataflow does is says, hey, what you can do now is I can go in and graphically create this stream. I create my apps that I want, right? My Spring Cloud Stream apps, and I want to link these together. I can use a graphical tool to really be able to link all those together. And then I can, at when I'm ready, just say, deploy it. And when I deploy it, I can deploy to one of three locations. I could deploy to on metal, my, my local machine, right? I can deploy to uh, Tanzu application service, what we used to call Cloud Foundry, right? Or I can deploy it to my favorite flavor of Kubernetes, wherever that is. So, wow, 
what that means is now I can go in and design and create these streams through a graphical UI in at specific times, deploy those out to a um, to whatever infrastructure I want. And some people say, can I deploy to both a Tanzu application service and two Kubernetes uh, services? Yeah, Dataflow allows you to have multiple targets that you can deploy these streams out to. So whether, I'm, like I said, in that memoir, we talked about that blended environment, right? Where we might be half on metal, half in uh, um, uh, Kubernetes, Dataflow will allow you to pick your platform where you want that data to go or those streams to go and it'll do that for you. And you say, hey, Glenn, the, the, the tap stream that we had, the one that was doing the filtering, we need to update that filter because it wasn't filtering enough, right? Okay. Well, now what I can do is I can adjust that function in that code, recompile that code. Remember, each of these elements that were comprising the bits or these elements of this stream are Spring Boot apps themselves, right? That are, they're compiled, they're Java apps. And the again, all I had to do is add in those dependencies to hook into the uh, uh, messaging framework, which again was Kafka, Google Pub, Sub, Rabbit, whatever. In that case, I compile it. And then all I have to do is tell Dataflow um, that that uh, particular boot app that you created, I can um, I want to update to the latest one. All right. And then it says, OK, I will do, go ahead and update that for you. It pauses the stream, updates that uh, bit, that uh, filter and deploys that out there for you to your Kubernetes. So the advantage here is with Spring Cloud Dataflow, what you're seeing is first off, Dataflow as an orchestrator, we're not pulling these apps into Dataflow or these functions into Dataflow. We're managing your applications, your boot apps in wherever you want them to be. And we kind of connect those pieces together for you. Um, so you don't have to worry about doing all the property work. We do all that for you through Spring Cloud Stream. And so that's the first part it does. The second part it does is you say, well, I have batch applications out there that I need to run. I need to orchestrate. I need to launch them, right? I need to schedule them. Well, Spring Cloud Dataflow will allow you to, again, register your boot applications, which are batch apps or just a Spring, uh, a Spring regular boot app that just has enable batch, enable task on it. And you can, re again, register these apps wherever they are, whether they're in Maven or a Docker image, whatever they, wherever they're at. And you can register that and say, I want this app to run now and I can launch it directly. Or I can go to like a cron job and just say, I want to run this job once every hour or, you know, at 10 o'clock tomorrow night. Or I want to run every five minutes and Dataflow will go to the cron job and schedule that for you and it will run. And then you say, well, Glenn, what was the status of that run? I can go to Dataflow and say, what was the status of my executions for these apps? And I can go in and filter out the apps I want to see, see if they ran. If they ran successfully, great. If they didn't run successfully, I can say, restart that app, it failed. And I can do all that, that orchestration through Spring Cloud Dataflow. And I can either do that through this UI, which is really cool, or I can do that directly through, um, we have a command line interface that you can use, or you can just send RESTful requests to do that uh, through Dataflow to handle all that stuff for you. Cool. So <laughs> in a sense, that's a lot of content. To me, what I hear is that there's been sort of an evolution of apps, you know, back in ye old days, you know, you had to go bake it all yourself. You had to go roll your own code, put together your own build file, stand up an app server, which I remember Oh my goodness! Inhale chiding what? the fact that Java is the only tech stack out there where you need to stand up a separate app server from your app, and a lot of other languages, etc., come with their own app server baked in. But in a sense, what Spring Boot made possible, real simple, was don't worry about running the app. We'll run the app for you. You know, run this command. Here's your jar file. It'll it bring it, it bring your own app server. Bring your own you know pad, embedded Apache Tomcat. So Spring Boot elevated us up a level of. Um, you write the you write the, the business logic and we'll wire the infrastructure and run it. Don't don't worry about servlet containers, don't worry about view resolvers and all that kind of nonsense. So we get up to spring boot apps, but then we get up to then the next step is like, well, I need to do batching. I need to be able to, I need to 
I need to track the state of it. I need to stop, start, you know, recover where I was at. And so Spring Batch said, okay, you write the process or you write the business logic out of process and we'll handle that, the rest of that for you. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that for you. And it does, you know, then, and there's like, but I need to coordinate jobs. And so spring integration comes along and says, we'll do that for you. Okay. Well, you know, you, you define the core, the, the business domain of it, and we will handle routing stuff, you know, and coordinating stuff. And so again, we keep evolving it and, and let's keep moving up towards the business. And this is um, our illustrious senior vice president, which I can't remember his name. It was always, let's focus on, move towards providing customer value instead of wiring infrastructure. Right. And so now with, you know, the data flow, it's up to the point of, well, Spring Cloud Stream, I was, I was always fascinated by, you know, how it was like, I don't, I don't care if it runs on Rabbit. I don't care if it's Kafka or the other bazillion. Focus on your function, focus. right? Sure, we can make it properties, but why do that? Why not just let, write those functions. Uh, every function's got inputs and outputs, and you focus on that and just tell us, what do you want, a rabbit? Okay, we'll do that. And then data flow is like, let's just, let's just take it a step further and now let's go build it. Let's drag, drag and drop the stuff on a UI and it will, you know, grab the parts, you know, to put that together and then push it out to the cloud. And so now you're really, as a developer, you're really interfacing with the, the, the business experts on your, on your contract about you're talking domain objects. You know, this is what, to me, this is what domain driven design is supposed to be. Let's let's define the domain, the objects that are done. Let's define the, the the processes that go, what goes to where, and we can drag and drop it. I mean, I can see, you know, the spring developer and the business domain expert sitting side by side. That's that's a real pair programming environment, wiring this stuff together and then push the button and push it and send it out to the cloud. And that that is the goal. We want you to focus on the app, right? Focus on the app, write the app, write your filter app, write your Twitter app, write your JWC app, write your uh, Enricher app, uh, write all that good stuff there, which is really cool, right? But then after you write all that stuff up and you've got to compile, there's Bees Boot apps out there, you shouldn't have to worry about how, you shouldn't have to worry about infrastructure of, of a, you know, a, a messaging framework when you're thinking about the code. So you write your boot app, you add these dependencies, your boot app, and then what happens is you can give this, if you will, you, you know, this this uh, jar file or a jar file wrapped as a, a Docker container, right? And somebody else can do either deploy that out there as a Docker container somewhere, deploy that app out there as just a jar executed. And then you can use something like Dataflow to say, look, I want to register this app. It's in this Docker registry over here. Register, 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 you know, all the bits that I want for my, you know, all my boot apps. Dataflow, I want to connect these boot apps this way. Push it out to my Kubernetes. I don't, and so you could say that you have one group of people that work on the app and they just put the bits in there that says, you know, I include these two dependencies, how y'all put it together, where you put it, that's that's how y'all want to use it, right? And Dataflow allows you to do that. Or And then, like I said, uh, oh, we need an update. So you update the app. Fine. We'll go in, we'll go to Dataflow and say update um, the filter on this stream right now and update it. Okay, it's working. Oh, let's roll it back. We can roll it back. All that management's done for you through Dataflow, which is pretty awesome. And that's where it's like uh, the, the goal of Dataflow is to orchestrate your streams or your ephemeral microservices, where they're just a straight up Spring Boot app that's, you know, uh, uh, that's working out there that you just put enable task on, or it's a real Spring Batch app. And, you know, you want to add, again, just that enable task uh, there so that you can run all run hundreds or thousands. I mean, I've talked to some people who run tens. 20, 30,000 apps an hour uh, from Dataflow, wow. right? They're just kicking them off like bam, 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 right? And uh, that's even low. I mean, I've there's someone that won't, I can't say, but someone said, oh yeah, we, we do more than that. I'm like, how much more? I can't tell you. And I'm like, well, <laughs> come on. So well, this again. Is, this is part of what the Spring team focuses on trying to do. You know, I, I can almost see 
a multitude of axes. Like there's, you know, this one primary axis of what I was talking about where let's just try to simplify the Java code that you write. So we're trying to make it where you only need to write the critical business oriented stuff. But then there's this other axis of, okay, I either want, you know, I'm either going to make just jar files or I'm going to bake a Docker container, you know? And so whether, whatever you're doing this way, you can pick and choose whether I'm going to make a, an Uber jar or if I'm going to roll a, a Docker container. And then there's this, you know, another axis is, and I need three hands. Um, <laughs> oh, here's your other we're hand. We're also working on Graal VM support. So we had the Spring yes. Native project. So we're making it where, what do you want to do? Do you want to bake your stuff as native artifacts? Do you want Docker containers? Do you want native artifacts in Docker containers? And your choices, you know, in how you're doing this have no have no bearing on the code that you're writing. So you can have different people focused on different aspects of um, of uh, rolling the whole thing together. And what's so cool about it is what we've done is the next level is like, you know, you're talking about. So one of the things that that we as a team got together and I, I'm going to I can throw I don't know how much praise I can do like Andy, Sebastian, all the oh, yeah. folks that worked on the on the native coding stuff um you know they said glenn uh you know they came to all of us and said hey can why don't you move your apps and run your apps uh, uh using native and so we worked and did a pre-compiled set of hints for that so now you can take a spring app and say hey i got a spring boot app i'm putting an enable task on it I can natively compile that using 0.11.2s that we have for Spring Native, and you can compile that down to. Uh, I'll never forget the first time I did it, and I set up all my hints in it, so users don't have to. You just say, uh, you just start your Spring task, you know, add an able task, do your stuff, right? And you compile it to Grawl, and it just works. And I'll never forget the first time I ran it. And I, I, I ran it and I looked over here because I was used to seeing that like that one half second, one second star of a boot. And it was like, it's done. Did it crash? No, it nope. didn't crash. It's there. It's done. And it, it just started that fast. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so fantastic. And then we were, I was playing with some other apps. And it was like you see these tiny little memory uh, 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 footprints. And you're like, oh, gosh, this is awesome. And the so I don't know if we are allowed, are we allowed to say it's going to boot in the next in boot three, which is coming out next year. So you'll get all this goodness in boot boot three coming out next year in spring six. But if yeah. you want to play with it now, this year, now it's this year. <laughs> next, this year, that's right, twenty twenty two. Gosh. But hey, yeah. bring me the questions for Glenn. Go post them in the live chat now. Um, or for me, if you've got questions either yeah, way. Yeah, ask away. I don't know if you uh, saw this, but we got a good uh, earlier. Kadir uh, Biram, thanks for, for posting that. Gave hey, Kadir. Us, gave you four thumbs up earlier. So I'd, I'd say kudos. Um, but there's but a there's, lot of stuff going on, folks. Yeah, I mean, there's a really lot. Cool. It's it's um, it's challenging, but it's cool. And I remember the first time I went and uh, I, I ran that, that job. I, I was uh, looking to shoot a video, and I was kind of like, let me – let me let me do a screen recording of the thing baking the Graal VM Docker container, and then when after 15 minutes had passed, I said, "Okay, that part's not going in the video because no <laughs> let me go let me speed that cycle up a bit." But then it starts in sub second time. I'm like, you know, after Done. 20 years of Java, you know, taking five, 10, 15, 60 seconds to start an app, it was like what? And I think our uh, our uh, a learned uh, Spring developer advocate, Josh Long, had uh, recently bought a new MacBook Pro M1 Max, yep. maxed out with all. I, I asked him, "How many cores did you get?" And he said, "All of them." <laughs> so he was that machine. He he ran. I think he ran uh, his demo app without Grawl, and it was sub second. But then he baked the Grawl, and it was like sub sub second, and it was just like yeah. Oh. It and the thing is, is that if you played with Grawl like last year, early last year, and you were to take that same compiled, it, they've even reduced the compile time it takes. So it's only like a couple of minutes now. We're like, you and me both were like, mm -hmm. well, uh, I'm going to go um, sort some socks while it compiles, uh, play foam swords with my kids, um, <laughs> something like that. But it's, it was, but now it's like, it only takes a couple of minutes and folks and the goal is a crawl if you haven't seen it it strips out all it, it really just says we don't need this don't need this don't need this and then creates a native image 
of your application. But it's very aggressive on what it gets rid of. And Greg will talk about that. It's very aggressive. And so what we did in the spring or what they did in the spring native project was they simplified and they made it where it, it creates a path that it, it says, oh, oh, girl, don't pull that out. We need this. We need this. We need this. And it simplifies that for you. And so you don't all you have to do, again, is just put is compile it using the spring native and you can go to start.spring.io include the native and then there's like i forgot what the exact command is to build it natively once you put it in you have to have Grawl installed and you can play with that and it, it is it is again uh they've sped that sucker up pretty uh, uh fast as far as the compile time but uh from the Grawl team but you pay that upfront cost but you get the benefits downstream now the one question we do get i'm running a little over here i apologize is it so, so it runs everything faster throughout the app and yeah it's like not necessarily it reduces your footprint right your memory footprint and it starts up faster but whether it runs your code faster or not you have to experiment that is true nothing is nothing is nothing is guaranteed um so you'd have to check it out um i think i've seen people question like whether or not should i use it or not and it's like well that that's where the cost you know the cost becomes the cost to produce versus the cost to start it becomes very pronounced when you start to say i'm running one copy in production then well is it is it worth it spending the 15 minutes which now may be 2 minutes to to crank that out you know what if you have a if you're a netflix shop you're you're cranking out a thousand commits today and you build every one well that's a lot of build time yes but what if you run 10,000 copies then you know the build time, then, you know, the, the savings get multiplied. So that's your scale factor of, uh, you know, what the savings are. And this is where things like Spring Cloud or was it Spring Cloud function or that they would use to run, mm -hmm. um, what do you call those Lambda funds? Those Lambda yeah, servers. yeah, to the Lambda. So, yeah, you could use, yeah, again, that's where, again, Spring Cloud function, if you're writing function-based apps, um, you know, that's a case where you probably want to go with a Grawl VM, right, and, and do the compilation. And, and there's, there's, there's a charge to it, so you got you remember that too, right? To play with it's free, but to put it in production, there's a cost. Um, but uh, the goal is is that if you're doing like functions, you use Spring Cloud Function to, to put that together. Again, the way they've done it is, and it's integration into Lambda, and I forgot what the others they support. Like they also the Microsoft uh, uh, oh, uh, Azure. Cloud Azure. Uh, they if you, what, what, whatever functions you're writing for whatever deployment on cloud. Spring Cloud Function is there for you, and it's got they've got samples on how to do that, which is really awesome and saves you a lot of time. And so, again, you can take that raw Java, put it out there. It will run that Java, but you have to remember you'll get that warm up for that first time. After that, you get the advantage, right, of uh, the, the JVM's already warmed up. But if you use Grawl, create the executable, you know, there you go. You don't get that initial warm up time that first time. So... Uh, that's the coolness of it. And so, again, you know, it's just where it's, things are just so exciting about what we're working on, you know, whether I'm, you know, again, pushing stuff out to TAS, where I'm pushing out TAS application servers, where I'm pushing out to Kubernetes on metal, blended. Should it be uh, just running as a, a jar? Never war. We don't, we do not support war. <laughs> okay. And, um, but uh, jar, whether it's a container, uh, you know, again, uh, to, to get it to, to your pod, of course, Docker is, or Docker, uh, to Kubernetes, you got to do that. But my gosh, there's so many things. And always remember, we're going to do our uh, channel, our inner, inner Josh. We, where do we start all this stuff at, right? Start.spring.io. And I won't go to his, I will not steal his, uh, 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 <laughs> his, his thunder there for all the things it solves. You got to listen to it. But uh awesome place to start and and that's what's cool about all this it's exciting times that's right you know it's i don't know every now and then i run into people are like you know is is spring complete or spring done i'm like no there are... <laughs> no. <laughs> to me this is to me part of this is the benefit of you know we work we interact with standards with inspects and things like that but that's not the focal point the focal point is solving problems and it's like what are the problems out there what are people having to do today and what people are doing today is very different than 10 or 20 years ago and this is where spring is all about what's the what's what's what do we need to do people need to build more systems we need 24 by 7 turnkey e-commerce systems and we need 
scalable cloud solutions. And that's, you know, and it's just, it's, it's not done. It's not done. And we're working on, you know, improving, getting more, you know, squeezing more efficiency out of your, you know, reduce your cloud budget. You know, if you, if you can, if you can spend the extra time on the build job and, and shrink the runtime to get stuff done. Yes. Dynamic expanding, collapsing systems, you know, through the, like you said, Tan, VMware Tanzu app server or not. Wait a minute. Did I say that right? Yeah, Tanz. Yep, Tan, yep Tanzu. Tanzu app service. Yep, and then app we got Tap service, that's coming app out. Server. I said yep. app server. Bad. Oh, brand. shame okay. on you. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's exciting. It's like you know, like with the the Tanzu app platform that's coming out, where you it's all good. It's all like, uh, um, uh, um, oh gosh, my di- you can tell uh, it's all GitHub driven or Git driven, right? I push yes. my stuff up, my code up to GitHub. And then through the tap, you know what this, this is come, coming out soon. It's or it's actually you can play with it now. And I push that out there, and it has it's hooked into Knave to simplify, and it will take your app, package it up, push it out there as a long running service, right? Uh, or long running uh, pl- uh, uh, LRP, a long running uh, process. And it's amazing what they've got that going on with there. And then like I was uh, talking with the Kubernetes or uh, chatting with some of the folks at Kubernetes, they're starting a batch work group there. So you think batch, what's, what's, who's doing that anymore? Kubernetes, man. It's really cool that they're actually starting a work group that says, look, we, we know there's jobs out there. There's cron jobs, but we need to think yep. batch too. And so I was chatting with those folks. It's awesome stuff. What's going on. And it's like, man, folks, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, there's a lot to learn, but, that means there's also other so many opportunities and the good news is the spring is there to help you to focus again on your business problem and that's the reason why is this is spring done no as long as there's new stuff that make your life easier we'll try to strive to get that stuff and make it easier for you so you can again right. focus on that business problem that is awesome well glenn thanks for coming on today's live stream at spring boot learning uh the Spring Boot Learning Channel. I want to remind everybody to smash the like button if you've gotten value out of this. Don't forget to follow Glenn. It's CPP WFS. Yes. And, and if you like this and want to support it even more, consider becoming a member over at springbootlearning.com slash member. And I like the um, reference you made to Azure because I actually have scheduled next Sunday. I have a certain person coming on the live stream. Woo! Cloud developer advocate Mark Heckler. Who used to oh, work on say hi Spring to Mike Mark, Mark for me. So, fellow uh, Spring Boot author and uh, now cloud advocate. So, we got some good stuff coming there. And uh, here we go. We do have a question here. Oh, I was like, let's get the question from Mister K- from Mister Kedir Berhan or miss i'm not sure so i apologize for that what do you guys what you guys think of the log4j vulnerability discovered last month it was all over the news um well ah. the, the fun part of that is there is actually apparently there's either two or three vulnerabilities the first one was the biggest one the, there there were a couple others that were of some concern but much lower risk factor and um there's actually a post over at spring.io slash blog where um patch releases with that uh, resolved this were were pushed out so Yes, the Log4j team did did make patch uh, emergency patch releases, and we did pick them up and alert the community. So, um, and this is part of the magic of Spring Boot. You can just go into your build file and bump up to a, a minor patch release version, and you're covered. Um, uh, apparently, it was in the it was not if you're using the API mo- module, uh, you're okay. If it's only if you're actually using the core module, where you possibly at risk or something like right. that. It was uh, the if you're using the log for J2 and what was it? Yeah, it was that. It was basically that. There was a the, um, oh what was it? I'm, I'm getting H2 one in this one confused. It was the logging side, not the logging side. It was the uh, CLI was part of it or the what was it? But yeah, it um, was. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of folks I know. And I, first off, I want to thank all the people that did the emergency patches out there in the community. Uh, first off, the log for j a few people for getting us, alerting us early. I uh, appreciate the boot batch team, or sorry, the boots and spring teams for getting, uh, you know, the, the we didn't have impacts per se in the spring com- itself, but to get the bomb updated, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you folks out there that worked out there to update your applications out there and spending that, those nights out there to, get that uh those things out there to keep uh the apps running and safe out there so thank you all for working those nights to do that 
All right. And I think with that, we're going to wrap up the live stream. So everyone, we'll see you next time. See you, folks.